final case that is set for argument today is, uh, <coughs> well, our, I should say, 18CA011405 and 18CA011417, Ohio Restaurant Investment of Wellington and uh, Timothy Weeks. Both parties are represented by counsel. Each side will have 15 minutes to present your arguments. Uh, the appellant may reserve up to, up to five minutes, I should say, uh, for rebuttal. If you want to reserve time, let me know, and I will try to keep you apprised of where you're at. Um, the court has read the briefs, and we are prepared to proceed if you are. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> if it pleases the court, my name is Kathleen St. John. I am counsel for the appellant cross Appley Timothy Weeks. I would like to reserve four minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. So turning to our appeal, there are two claims here, a dram shop and a spoliation claim. And we respectfully submit that this case is an unusually strong dram shop claim because it's in conjunction with the spoliation claim. I want to talk about each of them separately um, and then to talk about the two together. Um, but I think the important thing about the two together is we, it, it, the, the fact that there's two together distinguishes this case, kind of gives it a plus factor from all other dram shop cases cited by the parties. And the spoliation of evidence that would be very helpful to proving our case, again, is uh, stands in our favor here. Um, but turning to the dram shop action, I have three major points that I want to make. The first point has to do with the Ninth District case law. There are two Ninth District dram shop cases cited by the parties. The defendants rely on the Tillett case, and we have cited the Morrison versus Fleck case. And I want to emphasize the Morrison versus Fleck case a little more than we actually did in the briefs. The Morrison case is extremely important for two reasons. Number one, Morrison came after Tillett, and in Morrison, the court distinguished Tillett because in Tillett, the plaintiffs did not have an expert toxicologist, whereas in Morrison, they did. Moreover, in Morrison, the witnesses, that is the, the server who served the um, drunken driver his drinks at the bar, as well as the friend who gave him a beer or two subsequently. Both of those individuals testified that the drunken driver was not noticeably intoxicated at the time. But nevertheless, the fact that there was an expert toxicologist who was able to take the blood alcohol level that was taken approximately two hours after the accident and figure out how many drinks that individual would have been served at the bar and then determine that based on that number of drinks, he would have been um, noticeably intoxicated within the last drink or two. That was sufficient to cause this court to reverse the summary judgment granted to the bar. So I think that's extremely important in this case. The second point I want to make about the Dram Shop case is the reasons that the trial court basically rejected Dr. Stavis's affidavit, um, we believe respectfully are erroneous. And the trial court gave three reasons. The first reason the trial court gave was that Dr. Stavis's affidavit, and, and he had an extensive report that he incorporated um, by reference into his affidavit. Um, and in that report, the, the trial court said, well, Dr. Stavis didn't say exactly what blood alcohol level Raymond McKissick would have had when served the last couple of drinks. The, that's, that's not what matters. What matters here is Dr. Stavis is able to say, look, this guy had, at 11 o'clock at night, he had a .188 blood alcohol content, which is more than twice the legal limit. And from that, and from knowing um, Raymond McKissick's height and weight, and he's a, a relatively small man, he's 155 pounds, something like five foot nine, based on knowing that all the alcohol he consumed was consumed at the outer limits between 10 to 5 p.m. 
and approximately 9 o'clock, 9.20 p.m., that he had to, to reach that blood alcohol level at 11 o'clock at night, he had to have had, at the very least, four half 14-ounce Bud Lights plus 13 full one-ounce Jody Bombs, which had uh, one ounce of, of liquor in them. And that was his, his least possible, most favorable um, rendition to the bar. Um, if Raymond metabolized at a regular um, average rate, he would have had four half 14 ounce Bud Lights as well as 14.7 full one ounce Jody Bombs. So from this evidence, Dr. Stavis is able to say that he, this Raymond would have been in the excitement stage of intoxication and he would have exhibited noticeable intoxication um, that would have been evident to a bartender or the customers within the last one to two drinks that he was served. That is sufficient evidence under the Morrison case. That is sufficient evidence under the 10th District's recent case of Thompson versus Wynn, which just came out last December. Um, the Hulusak case from the 8th District. Um, this is sufficient evidence. Um, the other part, the second thing the trial court said in rejecting Dr. Stavis's affidavit was the fact that Dr. Stavis didn't take into account um, the chicken wings that Raymond had while at the bar. Um, Dr. Stavis's report actually does mention in the, the factual predicate he gives, he does mention that yeah, Raymond, um, the testimony is Raymond had a dozen chicken wings. Um, but Dr. Stavis is the expert toxicologist, a very experienced individual, and with all due respect, the trial judge is not. So Dr. Stavis knows what factors are relevant to determining the state of intoxication of Raymond McKissick at the time. Moreover, obviously that dozen chicken wings did not sober up Raymond McKissick if he's got a .188 BAC an hour and a half after the accident. The third thing that the trial court stated about Dr. Stavis's affidavit was, well, Dr. Stavis didn't have a chance to see, to observe Raymond McKissick. Well, certainly that's a true statement, but it's, it's not a, a relevant or dispositive statement. Expert witnesses don't have chances to see the tortfeasor. An accident reconstructionist isn't there on the scene. A toxicologist isn't there on the scene. But from their scientific methodology, they are able to determine what, you know, to, to give their scientific report as to the relevant fact, which again here, is that he was noticeably intoxicated at the time that he was served the last one or two drinks. Um, and again, the Morrison case, the Thompson case, the Hlusak case, all three of these cases involved toxicologists giving reports where summary judgment was reversed. Um, the third point I want to make about the tram shop claim is the trial court felt that our evidence went to constructive but not actual knowledge, and I respectfully submit that, that that's not accurate, that under the case law, and I believe the um, Bickle case is the, the kind of lead case that talks about this point, the, the people who serve the alcohol are not likely to admit that they served alcohol when the, uh, the patron was noticeably intoxicated because that is against their self-interest. That means they're admitting liability, essentially. So the courts recognize that circumstantial evidence is as good as direct evidence, and in this kind of cases is typically necessary to refute the direct testimony of the people who served the alcohol who say he wasn't noticeably intoxicated. So it does go to actual knowledge. It's not simply constructive knowledge. Um, turning then to the, and, and of course, there's a lot of other um, evidence and circumstantial evidence discussed in the briefs, but I'm trying to, to get everything in here. So um, I want to turn to the spoliation claim. Once again, I have three major points I want to make. The trial court was focused on the third element of the spoliation claim, which is willful destruction of evidence by the defendant designed to disrupt the plaintiff's case. 
The trial judge believed we did not have sufficient evidence to raise a genuine issue of material fact, and he gave three reasons. The first reason was that the DVR was destroyed during the normal course of business. Granted, that is the defendant's argument. Granted, when they get to the jury, they are free to make that argument. But the jury, reasonable minds, are free to disbelieve that argument. The, the bar owners, as well as the bar manager, knew about this death within minutes after it happened. A patron who'd been drinking at their bar for four and a half hours, or, or four hours, um, and who caused a head-on collision and killed our plaintiff's decedent five minutes after he left the bar, and that is good reason to preserve your surveillance video. And reasonable minds could say, I think they willfully had it overwritten when they decided not to preserve it. Counsel, what's in the record as to when, if, if anything's in the record, as to when the tape was actually um, recorded over? Jody Hilton testified, and, and I would have to go back to... Well, okay, so I know that I know that when the officer brought the tape back, I know from the brief, I don't know from the record, so... Okay, yes. <laughs> um, that uh, it wasn't immediately put back into the cycle. It wasn't immediately... It was set aside, and sometime thereafter, I, I'm guessing there must be some testimony that it, it was put back into the cycle where it could get recorded over over a period of time. My recollection is Jody Hilton testified that it was put back in service, if, if not immediately that moment, within okay. that first week, because we were told in discovery, and, and that is in the record, that um, the defendants believe it was overwritten when it was put in service that first week. And, and the thing is... Let me just interrupt you so you know. You're at the four-minute mark now. So oh. you're going to be using your rebuttal time, which you're, is fine. I just want to let you know that. If I've satisfactorily answered your question, I'm just going to breeze quickly through a couple of points. Um, the trial court said none of the eyewitnesses testified that Raymond was noticeably intoxicated. Well, that's the very point why we need the surveillance video. And the third point is the trial court said the only person to the only objective witness was Agent Campbell, and he said there was nothing on the video um, to show that, that Raymond was noticeably intoxicated. Um, we made the best evidence rule argument at the trial court, and the trial court did not at all address that in its opinion. And, and I respectfully submit that this is a case where Agent Campbell's um, testimony about what was on the video is so vague and meaningless it definitely doesn't overcome the best evidence rule. Um, it, it is not admissible under the best evidence rule. So we respectfully submit that the trial court, um, that the rulings on both the dram shop and the spoliation claims should be reversed. Three minutes. Thank you. Counsel, you'll have uh, 15 minutes, of course. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. May it please the court, Brian Winchester on behalf of Defendant Appellant or Defendant Appellee Cross Appellant Ohio Restaurant Investments of Wellington LLC. Um, first, I'd like to ask the panel a question if there's any questions on our cross appeal for the jurisdictional issues that have been fully briefed uh, as to the filing of the cross appeal. Uh, if there's any questions on that, I'd be glad to take it. Otherwise, I'd like to get to the heart of the arguments in this case. Okay, why don't we okay. proceed then? First of all, uh, the best evidence rule, as uh, Ms. St. John addressed near the tail end of her argument there, evidence rule 1004. There are exceptions to the best evidence rule, which are clearly met here. Uh, evidence rule 1004, subsection 1, the original is not required, uh, and other evidence of the contents of a writing, recording, or photograph is admissible if all originals are lost or have been destroyed, unless the proponent lost or destroyed them in bad faith. Um, and that kind of dovetails and goes hand in hand with that spoliation claim of whether or not the evidence represents uh, any factual issue of whether or not the 
DVR video of the night in question was willfully destroyed to interrupt plaintiff's case. Uh, if you look at plaintiff's uh, reply brief, I believe it's page six, they acknowledge one week, uh, which predates the written notice uh, from counsel for the estate, which predates the opening of the estate. So in the ordinary course of business, that tape was overwritten. Uh, counsel, so, uh, I guess I have in regard to the overwriting of the uh, video. Uh, I guess there's some evidence presented that the bartender had thought that the uh, agent from the Department of Public Safety was going to make a copy of it? That was the assumption and the belief why it was put back into service. And they never told her that? No, they just returned the DVR. They had previously, you know, their experience was if somebody wants to take it, they'll keep a copy and you can keep your DVR. Because they didn't do a download, they took the physical DVR machine back to the Ohio Department of Liquor Control and then returned the full machine itself, which coincidentally is still sitting in my office today if anybody ever wanted to make a forensic examination, which was never done by the plaintiff in this case. So then, <clears throat> in regard to the and the DVD and everything. So when the, I'm sorry, I had a little tickle in my throat, so I'm having a little trouble here, but I apologize, I'll try to get through it. <coughs> when the, they went through the DVD, I mean, when the agent took the DVR, um, he, he was investigating what happened, and they knew he was investigating for over-serving, possibly. And I'm not saying this is, uh, please hear what I'm saying, I'm not saying this is evidence that the bar has done it again, but they had been involved in previous litigation in regard to that, right? That is correct. Okay, so wouldn't you think uh, a bar that's been through this very thing before would keep the film footage and not have it rewritten? Under the belief that law enforcement still had a copy, that I don't think they had any duty whatsoever affirmatively without being on specific notice of the, uh, the need to preserve it. What you have is the standard under Smith versus Howard Johnson is willful destruction of evidence designed to disrupt plaintiff's case. When the report back from law enforcement is there's nothing to indicate any patron was overserved here, uh, how can that then be a willful destruction? That's actually an inadvertent destruction of something that would have been more exculpatory for the defendant, would have put them in a better position. Uh, so I think that's that's really the issue, and that's the spoliation factor. Any missing element of those standards from Smith v. Howard Johnson means plaintiff fails on their cause of action for uh, punitive dam I'm sorry, for spoliation of evidence. Counsel, I read that statement in the reply brief to, to say that the testimony was that it takes about a week, but there wasn't any testimony in any of the depositions or before the court as to exactly when that incident was overwritten. Am I incorrect in that? I believe it was within a week as well, and I believe that was in the record, which was why oh. I quickly had that at hand. I didn't have the entire record in front of me, but I did have plaintiff appellant's reply brief at page six where they acknowledge overwriting one week after the crash. Okay. Uh, the, the statement is, yet the Mosian's conduct in allowing the footage to be overwritten one week after the fatal crash smacks of bad faith. That's the allegation. And in the acknowledgement in the plaintiff's brief. The other factor missing on the, the spoliation issue is One well, quick question. Yes. Would it be bad faith if they knew that the liquor control did not keep a copy of the... Only the if they were on notice of evidence designed to disrupt plaintiff's case. Uh, there's no evidence that this was willfully destroyed in any manner whatsoever, nor was it designed to disrupt plaintiff's case. Those are those critical pieces that are missing from that, the elements of that cause of action. Furthermore, uh, there were at least eight additional witnesses identified throughout the course of discovery who were in the bar that night, never deposed, never subpoenaed, nothing else done. Uh, plaintiff had plenty of opportunity to go and try and establish whether or not Raymond McKissick was visibly intoxicated while served an alcoholic beverage at the Mosey Inn on the night in question. So what we have, spoliation is missing, willful destruction, designed to disrupt plaintiff's case, the actual disruption of plaintiff's case, or knowledge of litigation. They were not put on notice until after overwriting 
So each and every one of those elements fail. And as Ms. St. John argued to you just 12 minutes ago, uh, on spoliation, you're free to disbelieve. Uh, that's not the summary judgment standard. Uh, it doesn't ask you, even though, even in a de novo review, to ignore the testimony and disbelieve it. Uh, you're not the trier of fact. You're to take the testimony as presented. Uh, one of the other issues for this appeal was we actually had three assignments of error. Um, the third of assignment of error was not addressed, and that was a claim for punitive damages at the trial court level. Um, specifically, the trial court found it is not a separate cause of action. It's not available for a death claim without a claim of property damage or conscious pain and suffering, both of which are missing in this case, uh, and no evidence of those factors in the record. Um, and as to the punitive claim for spoliation, that's not there either because using equipment in day-to-day -day operations and overwriting before notice of a potential claim is neither willful nor designed to disrupt a case. Then in turning to the elements of the dram shop cause of action, uh, what we have is a specifically statutorily created cause of action. Revised Code 4399.18b. First of all, it's incumbent upon the impellent to prove that the intoxication caused the accident. No law enforcement depositions, no accident reconstruction, uh, nothing as to the cause of the accident as to whether or not the alleged intoxication caused it. Well, counsel, it's a summary judgment, right? So don't they just need to raise a genuine issue of fact regarding the cause? Uh, okay. I would submit to you that they have not, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, that they have not submitted any evidence whatsoever of the cause of the accident other than speculation and innuendo that the alleged intoxication of Raymond McKissick caused the accident. About the passenger's statement, he was unable to testify regarding the cause of the accident. Is my recollection of his testimony? Very intoxicated, reckless driving. Wasn't that the gist of a statement? Of the police statement? No, the passenger. Correct. Of his statement to the police, okay. um, which he was the one who was reportedly vomiting. Over, he was in fact intoxicated. Uh, the passenger, as to his ability to recall and testify. Well, you're not debating, are you? You're not contesting that your, your, your client was intoxicated, or your, the driver was intoxicated. Did he have a point one eight eight? No, it's the, the question and the linchpin question is 4399.18A1, whether or not the permit holder, the Mosian, knowingly sold an intoxicating beverage to a noticeably intoxicated person. The impact of alcohol is different on different people. And if we go through the litany of the case law, simply an elevated blood alcohol content is not equal to dram shop liability. Rockwell v. Ullman, uh, 8th District, 1998. 1998. Uh, Halusak, even with a toxicologist, 8th District, 2000. Barnes v. Holmes, 7th District, 2005. Uh, Kaplinger, uh, 2011, of the 12th District. Inferences and uh, attacks on credibility are not enough. They have to show knowingly sold an intoxicated beverage. And what we have is uh, Lesnow v. Andati from the Ohio Supreme Court, as followed by Lanham v. Fox in the 5th District in 2014. Uh, actual knowledge is the standard that we're at. Not speculation, not innuendo, not inference, actual knowledge. Uh, so we do not have that. That's clearly undisputed in this matter. And the, the Bickle decision uh, cited by opposing counsel that was relied upon heavily, in fact, that is clearly distinguishable and where it was reversed was on a question of fact of whether or not the tortfeasor was staggering inside the bar, not based upon uh, an elevated blood alcohol content, simply a question of fact on his visible, actual visible intoxication. Uh, based Counsel, upon how many people were at the bar at the time? How do you... We believe it was approximately 12 people. So we had an additional eight people identified in answer to, I believe it was interrogatory number 17, two different couples, several other people. So we had a number of additional people that could have been deposed. And, and, the, and according to the uh, 
appellant here, there was 210 drinks served during that time period. That's what showed on the register. I don't think that's, there's no testimony of that, the relationship to the register tape to how many people were actually in the bar at a given point in time. There may have been people coming and going throughout the evening. I thought you just said there were 12 people there. At, that we have been able to specifically identify. Uh, additional persons, I do not know. Um, I believe there were, and I believe the testimony was, there were additional people. But we went through and tried to identify exactly who was in the bar that evening, and we believe it was an additional approximately eight people. That's still a significant amount of drinks per person. I mean, Which, you can't just look at the average, but I'm just saying for that no more people than were there, you know, the volume of people that were there, or the number of people, I should say, that were there. That, I, that I, may I, be. I understand that doesn't make a Dram Shop, shop Act uh, violation either, but I was just thinking that's a lot of drinking. Not a pretty fact, but in actuality, not a material fact. Um, and that's what we're at on the summary judgment stand material facts, genuine issues of material fact, and as a matter of law based on the record, we would request that you affirm the trial court's rulings, um, and alternately, if you do not, then we have to reach the issues on the cross appeal. We would submit to you that as a matter of law, under revised code 4399.18, uh, punitive damages are not recoverable as a matter of law for a tram shop claim. The statute specifically provides remedies personal injury, death, or property damage. That's it. Uh, that can be, you know, you can follow the recent Ohio Supreme Court decision, Johnson v. Montgomery, exclusive remedy, violation of the Dram Shop Act. That's it. That's what you have by creating a cause of action. That, I'm sorry. Uh, it's, uh, oh, it's okay. I will actually didn't start speaking. I just said nothing. Um, uh, I, but, um, you know, you're... Your argument, I think, is, is that the trial court can't change its stance on that if it gets reversed between uh, it, uh, time it gets reversed and final resolution of the case. But what would prohibit the trial court from saying, I'm now finding that you cannot get punitive damages on a dram shop case? I don't think anything would. What we do have is under the doctrine of merger, because we're here without disposal of all claims and under 54B, we have a no just cause for delay determination. That I understand. Um, and I, however, the harm would only accrue if the case was remanded and uh, the trial court made an erroneous decision in the completion of the remanded case, correct? Correct. However, once a final judgment is entered, which is a 54B judgment of no just cause for delay, all interlocutory orders are then emerged into that final judgment, which includes the ruling for the judgment on the pleadings. Um, and I believe it was this court in 2009 in Haley versus Riesinger uh, that said the interlocutory orders that exist that relate to the ruling merge. And the in, threshold issue relates. In counsel, even with the 54B, though, even if it were an order that could be appealed, this court still has the ability to say things are moved or premature or any too when they're looking at orders. That means we have jurisdiction to, to say it's premature or we have jurisdiction to say it's moot. That doesn't mean we have to look at it on the merits. I believe if you follow Haley versus Riesinger, if you find that the judgment on the pleadings ruling on the punitive damages under the Dram Shop Act, that you do have to consider it because it does merge because it relates. Or you're free to find that it doesn't relate and it's subject to further review at the trial court level, but Quite candidly, my preference is we never reach that issue and you simply affirm the trial court's ruling on summary judgment. Thank you very much, Your Honors. Thank you. And that leaves us with three minutes for a rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honors. <clears throat> I'm trying to understand my notes here. Um, so, so let me backtrack. Um, with respect to the number of people who were in the bar during the period of time that Raymond was there, the testimony from Jody Hilton, and I cite record uh, number 104, pages 124 to 125, Jody said there were between 8 and 11 people present. 
So there is evidence that that 210 drinks were consumed by, at most, 11 people, according to Jody Hill. And in fact, the one thing that Agent Campbell did say that was a fact that made sense was that Jody was right that there were about 10 people in the bar that entire time. So a lot of alcohol was being consumed that night. Um, proximate cause. The, this was not an issue in the summary judgment briefing. As I indicated in our appellate brief, this is something that the defendants brought up for the first time on appeal. It was not properly briefed or considered by the trial court, and I've cited case law for the proposition that therefore it's not something that's properly before this court. However, I would note that in the very last statement in Dr. Staubis's uh, report that's incorporated into his affidavit is that this was a proximate cause, that, that the intoxication of Raymond Campbell was a, a Raymond McKissick was a proximate cause of the accident. Um, the trial court did not address the merits of the punitive damages um, arguments. It, it, the trial court simply found that since the, he was finding no liability, therefore there was no reason to reach the punitive damages, so it's really not an appropriate um, issue to reach on the, the main appeal. Um, the, and I'm just glancing through here, um, I mean, credibility, yeah, the court can't resolve summary judgment by making a credibility determination, but it can recognize that there are credibility issues with respect, particularly to the biased witnesses, that preclude accepting their testimony outright, and that's the whole idea behind the circumstantial evidence. Um, Turning to the cross appeal, uh, I don't believe that this, um, the uh, decision from February is merged into the final appealable order. Um, I think that the, the really important pivotal point there is that um, the, uh, nobody's been harmed. I mean, there, there's, there's been a, a legal determination, but there's been no substantial right of any party affected, and ultimately, uh, assuming, as we hope, that this court reverses and we go to trial, if the jury awards punitive damages, then that issue is a right issue for the defendants to argue on an appeal from that judgment. Um, uh, Counsel, you're out of time now. All right. We respectfully ask that this court reverse and remand. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you both for excellent arguments. The court will take the matter under advisement and issue a decision in due course. The court, uh, clerk of courts will mail a copy of the decision to both of you on the day it's released. The opinions are also posted on the Supreme Court of Ohio's website. The court is going to be adjourned until Tuesday, April 18th, when the court will be sitting back here in Lorain County. Thank you again. Thank you.